Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended this, the dishonored master manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people in this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are the people of the light. I tell you, use world, worldly love, wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling work worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. God, we seek to serve you by serving others, the poor, the needy, the least, and the lost. Help us to hear your words anew, that we may become more faithful stewards of the gifts that you give us each day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to read you the text that David just read. I'm going to read it in a different translation to see if it makes any more sense to you the second time around. So I invite you to sit back, maybe even close your eyes, and just listen to this story again. Jesus also said to the disciples, a certain rich man heard that his household manager was wasting his estate. He called the manager in and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me a report of your administration because you can no longer serve as my manager. So the household manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is firing me as his manager? I'm not strong enough to dig and I am too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from my management position, people will welcome me into their homes. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. And he said to the first one, how much do you owe my master? And he said, 900 gallons of olive oil. And the manager said to him, take your contract, sit down quickly and write down 450 gallons. And then the manager said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, take your contract and write down 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. People who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much, and the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with much. If you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you haven't been faithful with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. So that second time through, that makes a lot more sense, right? Yeah. 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 No, not, not for me. 
not the third or the 12th or the 24th time that I read that scripture this week. I've wrestled with it all week. About Thursday, I went back and looked at the other scriptures for today, and I thought maybe I will just switch it out for one of those. When I read a piece of scripture, I do, I do it through a spiritual discipline called Lexio Divina, and all that means is it's, it's divine reading. Not everyone I know does this, but anyone can. You don't have to be a pastor or a seminary stu student or even a, the a theology professor to do this. And it's, it's just a way of looking at and listening to scripture and seeing what jumps out at you in the text. What word or phrase practically stands up and hollers and says, hey, come over here and look at me, take a closer look. What makes you uncomfortable about this scripture? What brings you joy? Or what causes you to scratch your head and go, what did I just read? Because one of those reactions when I'm studying scripture for, our, for the sermons on Sunday, one of those reactions is where I start to dig in and see where the Holy Spirit is taking me. I search and I study and I write my hypothesis and then I go to resources from folks who have made their life's work studying and teaching and learning about scripture. And I find out how close I came to their understanding and then I adjust my course from there. So that way, I'm not just telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I've discovered, maybe for the first time for myself, what I've confirmed from other wise and scholarly sources and then how we can relate it to our lives today. And then I spend time thinking about it and how to explain it or how to retell it from a different perspective, from a more modern perspective, so we can still hear. We can hear how God is still speaking to us and we can see why it still matters to us that God is speaking to us. I usually use a story from my life or someone else's life or a book or a movie or something like that to put Jesus' teaching in that different perspective. But this week, there was nothing that I could have used that would have made this scripture easier for any of us to understand. And I tried. I got really close. I was thinking about the boys have had me watching The Flash. And I, I thought about using that. And I thought, you know, by the time I actually had to explain to you who The Flash was and this whole timeline thing, it would just, it would, yeah. So I decided not to try. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through what it means, what I've learned. And afterwards, we'll just try and see if we can figure out how that still applies to us as followers of Christ and as a church of Christ followers. And one of the things that was really helpful to me was a podcast by Pastor Brian McLaren. He actually explained this scripture at Luther Seminary's annual festival of homiletics, which is a convention for preachers and pastors. And he describes the historical economic context of first century Israel which makes a difference in understanding this text. Because the Romans were in charge of everything. Most of them lived in the wealthier areas down south, in and around Judea. But the resources that they wanted, and the resources that they needed, were found further north, up and around Galilee. That's, these were things like the wheat and the wine and olive oil. Now, the Romans weren't about to move into those poor and rural communities, and build their own farms and harvest their own crops because that's just not how they did things. The way that they got what they wanted was through taxation. Huh, it's not so different, huh? <laughs> it was also the way that they maintained the status quo. Huh, not so different. With the rich and the poor on opposite ends of this social spectrum and no real way to change their status. The rich would continue to get richer and the poor would continue to be poor or get poorer. So they created taxes on the poor farmers' crops, the ones that they wanted, the wheat and the wine and the olive oil. But it was more than what the farmers could afford. So the Romans magnanimously offered to pay their taxes for them, all for the low, low price of having to sell them the deed for their farms. And they could even remain on them, rent-free, as long as they continued to work them and give the Romans a part of their crops every year, every harvest time. And the Romans didn't even want to go collect the crops that they were going to get. It probably wasn't even safe for them to go because they weren't real popular after creating this system of taxation, you can imagine. So they hired managers to go and do this for them. And on top of the interest that they, the Romans charged the farmers, which was a percentage of the crops, 
The way that they paid their managers was to allow them to also take a share of the crops above and beyond their share. And now this particular Roman in our text today, the rich man, he looks around and he realizes, you know, all my friends are throwing more parties than I am. They're eating more bread, they're drinking more wine, and they're overall, they're getting more benefits from their farms than I'm getting from mine. So he's a little bit embarrassed about this and he's a little angry. So he calls his manager in and he says, look, I trusted you to take care of my business for me. You've wasted my time. You've squandered my money. I hired you to do a job. I hired you to figure out my share of the crops from my farms and to go get them for me. But my friends seem to be getting a lot more wheat and wine and olive oil. So I'm holding you responsible. I'm gonna fire you because you obviously haven't handled my resources very well. Bring me all your books so I can sort out the mess that you've made and I'm going to have to find somebody else to take over for you. And the manager can't believe it. He's worked for this guy for a long time and he's done everything that he was supposed to do, even though the poor farmers hated him because of it, because he worked for the Romans. It's not his fault that the rich man's friends were greedy and they took more than their fair share and it's not even his fault that the other managers were okay with doing that as well. So he doesn't know what he's gonna do. He's like the blue collar middle class. He's the middleman here. He doesn't have money to buy a farm and to tax farmers, but he's also never worked in a field. His trade has been tax collecting and word of mouth is going to spread. No one in Judea is gonna hire him and no one in Galilee is going to help him. And he suddenly realizes how expendable he has been all along. He realizes also how he's treated the farmers. He's treated the farmers the way this master is treating him. And even though he wasn't as bad as some of those other managers, and even though he wasn't half as terrible as the Romans who hired them in the first place. So what he decides to do, he figures the only thing that he can do to try and make things right, at least with the farms that he manages, he figures that if he goes back to those farms one last time, and he just collects what the rich man is due and eliminates his own cut, that that will make what he takes from the farmers closer to what is actually fair. And maybe by doing this, the farmers will forgive him and they will be compassionate to him when he comes crawling back home without a job. And on the off chance that it will matter to the rich man, he'll have done the right thing by him as well, collecting his share and delivering it to him when he turns over the books. And the rich man is amazed at his resourcefulness. Most translations, I, Gary and I actually, both of us, poured over, I think, all of the translations. I think we did, right? Most translations say that the manager was admired for being shrewd. But the original Greek word translated as shrewd was actually sensible or practically wise. So he was commended for his wisdom and his sensibility, for his quick thinking in the face of personal disaster. So it's not as disingenuous as I once thought when I first read this, shrewd. And the man turns out not to be as dishonest as the text leads us to believe as well. Even our headings, you read them in your Bible sometimes, those aren't actually part of, our, our, of, the, of scripture. We've put those in there. And from translation to translation, they can vary a lot. That translated word dishonest is actually unrighteous or unjust. And that changes the meaning for me too. The man was unjust because he was part of a system that created a hierarchy of rich and poor, of those who have and those who don't, of those who can do something for us and those who cannot. He was unjust because Jewish law actually forbids folks from charging interest on a debt. It's like when Jesus calls Zacchaeus down from that tree to have dinner with him. Zacchaeus knows that Jesus knows that what he's been doing as a tax collector for the Romans is wrong. So he promises to pay back double what he's taken from all those other folks in order to set things right with Jesus, to become righteous again in Jesus' eyes. And the Pharisees are offended by this. They're offended when Jesus eats with Zacchaeus because eating with someone back in those days was a way of saying, we're equals. So you remember last week, they, the Pharisees grumbled and they said, this man, he eats with tax collectors. They're not equal. 
Jesus said we should use worldly wealth to make friends for ourselves so that when our wealth is gone here on earth, we'll still be welcomed into eternal homes in heaven. But having wealth is not a bad thing. Putting wealth above relationships is. Because everything that we have comes from God. We take nothing with us when we go home to God. The kingdom of God doesn't need anything from this world, our temporary home. The kingdom of God is about souls, not stuff. That's what Luke keeps trying to tell us again and again, because that's what Jesus keeps trying to tell us. Jesus says whoever is faithful with a little bit can be trusted with a lot more. And if we take good care of what's given to us here on earth, even though it doesn't actually belong to us, if we don't do that, how are we ever going to be able to handle the true riches that come in heaven? The kingdom of God values people over possessions. God wanted a relationship with us so much. God valued a relationship with us so much that God sent us Jesus to show us just how much we're worth, just how much we're loved, just how much we're valued and treasured and adored. God sent us Jesus to pay a debt that Jesus didn't owe because we owed a debt that we could never be able to pay. And Jesus tells us we cannot serve two masters. We'll either hate one and love the other, or we will be loyal to one and have contempt for the other. These are strong words, especially when you're talking about what we think about God and what we think about our stuff. We'll either love one and hate the other. He's trying to get us to put wealth in its proper place. What do we prioritize? What do we struggle with? Where is God in that balance? What do we love? What do we hate? What are we loyal to? What do we have contempt for? Look at our checkbooks, look at our appointment books, and we'll have a good idea. When Jesus challenges the Pharisees and the chief priests and the political leaders, he is turning what we think and what we value here on earth. He's turning all of that upside down. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. A little child shall lead them. Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Invite those to the banquet who have no way of repaying to you. One of the experts in the law once asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. And Jesus answered him, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with everything. And the second greatest is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, to show love for others the way God shows love for us. Here he says we cannot serve both God and wealth. And we're warned about wealth in scriptures more than any other thing. Jesus knew that we would struggle with this, that we would struggle with putting relationships underneath resources. But we're called to view wealth as just another resource, to use it as a resource, as a way to love God and to love others. Money is necessary for us to live. So it's not a bad thing, but we don't have to live for money. We're supposed to live for God. We're supposed to prioritize God above everything else, including, probably especially, our possessions, our wealth. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been warned about it so many times. Jesus was telling his disciples that the Pharisees were not valuing people as much as they valued what they could get from people. It's one of the things that folks often complain about churches today, right? Every time I go to church, they talk about money, right? The only thing the church cares about is what I have to give. You hear that all the time. I hope you don't hear it here. We hear that all the time. And I read somewhere in my research this week that churches thrive under the lie that we actually can serve God and money. But we can't. It's not shrewd. It's not wise. It's not just. We serve God by serving one another. We may need money to do that. And that's okay. It's okay at church. It's okay in our personal lives. As long as we think of it and we use it as a resource. As long as we never look at folks and think that their resources are more important than us having a relationship with them or them having a relationship with God. That we never count what they have to give us as more important than what we have to give them. Living water, the bread of life, the gospel. The kingdom of God is so much more about giving than it is about getting. And when I was thinking about this sermon, I was thinking about the movie Dances with Wolves. 
actually came to mind. Thinking about, if you've ever seen it, Dances with Wolves, when the West was settled um, by, uh, by us. And um, the first soldiers, first settlers who go out there, they are learning what the Native Americans, how they've lived with the land and how they've lived with one another. And this one scene that stands out to me, thinking about this scripture, is when they, the Native Americans look out over this hill, they come over this, over this hill, and they look out and they see this whole field full of slaughtered buffalo. And all the buffalo have been slaughtered and their hides have been taken by the soldiers. And all of that meat is rotting. As far as the eye can see, there's all these buffalo and the meat is just rotting. And these Native Americans, they, they used those buffalo, they were a resource for them. They used the hides, they used them for blankets, they used them for clothing, they used the, the innards, they used the organs, their medicine men used some of those things. Um, they used the, the meat, obviously, to eat. They used bones for jewelry and, and to barter. They used every part of the buffalo. So looking out over that, that hill, these Native Americans looking out over this and seeing this wasteful, how, how wasteful it was, that these soldiers came and they just took what they wanted. They just took what they what they thought they could use and they left the rest of it to rot and, and so much of it could have been used and it was wasted, it was squandered instead of just taking what they needed. And as a church and as Christ followers, Jesus calls us not to hoard we couldn't, you know, with, with those buffalo, you couldn't have, you could, there was no way for them to preserve all of that buffalo, so it was just a waste. But we're called not to hoard, like the man with the, with the barns, I'll just tear down my barns and I'll build new barns. No, just use what you have, use what you need, that's it. Share in community, love one another, put God above everything else. So Jesus calls us not to hoard what we have or to squander what we've been given but just to use, to use just what we need. To love God, to serve God, to love others and to serve others with our resources, but to always put our relationships over those resources. Amen? Amen. And amen.